too. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner. And we are navigating the journey. Navigating the journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for the end of life care and to assist people to talk about their wishes. Over the past six months, we have invited members of various religions and traditions to talk about the end of life customs in their culture. Today will be different. Now that the 2017 legislative session has come to a close, we can reflect upon the efforts advanced or not this year and how they will impact Hawaii moving forward. Today, our guest is Senator Will Espero. Senator Espero represents the 19th Senate District, which is Eva Beach, Eva Ocean Point, Eva by Gentry, Iroquois Point, and portions of Elva Village. He currently serves as the majority floor leader of the House Senate and chair of the Committee on Housing, which we will talk about. He sits as a member on the Committee of Commerce and Consumer Protection and Health and the Committee on Education and Higher Education. Above all, he supported our medical aid and dying bill. We have just come from the 11th Annual Legislative Review, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which was the assessment of the 2017 legislative session sponsored by Hawaii Alliance for Retired Americans and Kua Council. Each year, they honor certain individuals and organizations that have demonstrated an understanding of the important issues to seniors and have been strong advocates for seniors. I'm proud to say our own John Radcliffe received the Shining Lights Award for his work with Death with Dignity, the very subject that we talk about every week. However, this is his 48th treatment of chemotherapy. And it's also his birthday today. John McDermott was also honored. He's the Hawaii State Long-Term Care Ombudsman for his tireless commitment to seniors and their health care. So today, we will visit with Senator Aspero. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being my guest and a longtime friend. But all of you people that know, that are with us every week, I only invite friends. And I know the best friends in Hawaii. Just absolutely thank you for being with us today. Aloha, Marcia. Thank you for inviting me. Now, tell us, how long have you been in the legislature? Uh, this is my 18th year in the legislature. I was uh, three years in the House of Representatives, and this is my 15th year in the Senate. Uh, plus, I worked eight years in the administration of Mayor Frank Fossey. So, 26 years in state and city government. It's, uh, That's a long time. Yes, it and, has. Uh, well, anyway, let's, you're not a senior yet, but what a retirement that is. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll get something out of that. Yes. Yeah. So. Let's start at the beginning. I, I, we said that you supported our bill of medical aid and dying, as did the Senate, overwhelmingly, I might add. Yes, it was a 22 to 3 vote. Um, and interestingly enough, the last time we took up Death with Dignity, which was over 10 years ago, yeah, right. I believe the Senate was 14 to 11. So. There's been a dramatic change, change in the um, yeah. number and the support. It, the House, the last time, was overwhelming for it, and the Senate was, we lost by three votes. This time, it's just the opposite. Yes, and uh, my understanding is uh, this will likely be revisited again next year. Uh, in the House, uh, the bill died in the well, Health it, Committee. But it was deferred, not died. Correct, yeah. For, uh, it was deferred, but in essence, it meant that it was uh, stalled for this legislative session, and it's still alive for next year. Uh, we could attempt to use the same measure or um, try another bill, and that remains to be seen, but it's certainly uh, an issue that I know will, will come up again. Good. Let's, and, of course, we're going to come back and have all of our people on board with us to help us get it through. So. You are on the housing committee, so let's let's. You did a great piece at where we just came from, talking yes. about 
housing and its impact on us today and where we're going, the needs of, as we grow so rapidly, the needs of people. Yes. So tell us about housing. Well, housing is a topic that I could speak about for hours, but I know we only have a, a, just under 30 minutes. Uh, but of course, this is one of the, the most pressing and important issues facing our state today because of the cost of housing. And what makes matters um, you know, significant is that our population is continually growing. Um, my projection is in the next 50 years, there'll be an additional 500,000 people living on Oahu. Oh my. And that's uh, just, um, right now we have just under a million. So 500,000 is significant. So where would we put all those people? Exactly. Um, we need to plan for the future, which is what we're doing now. Um, although many people have many ideas, but uh, the long-term planning of where people are going to live, housing, where they're going to work, where they're going to play, where they're going to go to school, how they're going to move around. I mean, those are uh, the hot topics of today when you look at rail, housing costs, job creation, building out universities and schools. Uh, what, one of the things we didn't talk about, in, we, you just mentioned employment. With this new technology like we have here, this marvelous technology of FinTech, why is it that we aren't teleporting to work? Why is it that we, everybody is on that freeway at the same time? Why can't we have jobs that we, because everybody goes to work, they sit at their desk and they open the computer. Why can't they do this in a computer cafe or at home or something to stay off of the road? Right. That's a very good question and uh, this has been a, an item that actually has been discussed for years. Uh, in Honolulu, for example, we have the second city, right. and one way to deal with the traffic problem would be to create more jobs in West Oahu so people don't have, have to, to commute. Yeah. And there's also been talk about um, having uh, employment centers, job centers, where people can go and, and like you said, work up on a computer, have access to a copying machine, a scanner. Uh, but much of the um, effort has to be a joint collaboration between uh, government and the private sector and businesses. In terms of government, we've tried to spread around uh, satellite city halls, uh, state offices in different areas of the island so that they are close to where people live and people don't have to be driving. Uh, but you know, the private sector has to also um, look at its needs and how it can better utilize its employees using technology. When, when you look at the fact that the federal government, the state, and the city are the major employers on the island, they're the ones that have to figure that out, how to A, stagger hours. I mean, there's no reason that the city should be open from 7.45 to 4.30 when I know there are employees at the city that would love to work later after the traffic. Why can't we stay open to accommodate people that uh, live in your area where the traffic is the worst, Kapolei, and have staggered hours so people, the traffic isn't so. And then that has been an issue that has come up um, because many of our or all of our government employees basically are unionized, it has to be a union negotiation and a collective bargaining issue. Uh, but certainly, um, you also have to have the resources and to extend um, the work time and or facilities, obviously, was going to mean more electric costs, more air conditioning costs, and, and the slew of um, issues that parents have to deal with in terms of children going to school, picking up children, you know, um, extra um, curricular activities, uh, and, and that all of those are, are part of that discussion. But 
you know, there have been efforts to look at staggered working hours uh, and more um, online and computer registration and the use of computers. For example, at the legislature, uh, you can provide testimony from your computer. You don't have to physically come down anymore. Someone can go to capital.hawaii.gov, find a bill that they want to testify about, and then present their testimony at home, if they're at the beach, at work, and thus keeps them off the road. So there have been efforts to use technology to our benefit. However, um, it's complex and complicated when you just look at all of the moving parts and all of the stakeholders and trying to determine what is best and how are you going to implement those decisions. And then, of course, the employees themselves and how it impacts them and their families. Well, the, the police department says, I'm going to ask you the same question. What is the busiest time for the police in a 24-hour day? The busiest time? I'm going to guess it's in the evening. What time? Um, my guess will be uh, 7 to 10? No. <laughs> Three o'clock. In the afternoon? In the afternoon. This is what the police department told us. Three o'clock, because kids are out of school, parents are at work, there's more traffic. At three o'clock, schools let out, the university, teachers, that are the traffic, and kids running around right. doing whatnot. That is their busiest time okay. in a 24-hour day. So when you look at that and you say, well, don't we need to look at at those kinds of things in determining how we go forward in building the city. No, definitely. And certainly um, there are many ideas out there on how we can improve things and make changes, but because of the um, individuals involved and the entities and organizations, as I said, it, it's rather complex and it's easier thought about than actually implemented and done. And let's go back to your plan about the housing. Okay. What we were told from the city that the master plan is already 25 years old and they're operating on a 25 year old plan and everything is changing so fast, does the city do you, the city and the state, work together on a master plan? Have you worked together? Especially with what you're talking about and the projected growth. And they're working 25 years back. Well, um, the state has uh, master plans. The county has master plans. But people need to understand that those are just um, fluid documents and thoughts that, that can change overnight, um, depending on the economy, uh, depending on revenue, and you know, when you're looking at the budget cycles, they're usually like to look five to 10 years uh, of mm. the budget cycle uh, in terms of planning and preparing. But we just, in this last election, one of the, um, um, charter amendments was to allow the city to update those plans, that's why I know the date, update those plans up, 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 up every five years. Well, if they haven't done them in 25 years, the thought that it's going to take that long. Yes, I, and, and so I'm asking, do you work together? I mean, there's only one of you know, this little island, there's only so many places to go. Do you and the county work together on these plans, the projection of the growth that you talked about? Have, are you working together? That's my question. I, well, I can say that information is shared, but the state government is a separate entity from the county right. government. Yeah. And then you've got uh, the different counties on the neighbor islands. So when you're looking at, for example, the general plan of right. the counties, uh, that is the responsibility of the county, of the mayor and the city council. Right. Okay, that's not the responsibility of the governor or the legislature. But if there's information that need to be had, if, if they need data, uh, there's certainly that sharing. And if there's meetings where 
a state official can come and provide information, that's done. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's up to the county and, and its members uh, to put that and put those general plans together. Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, he used to be with an administ Fosse administration, as I was. Yes. And so, the, yes, we do understand. That's why I'm asking. The, now, the, the, the collaboration, because in those days, you know, there was no collaboration between right. the county and the state. Uh, now, the working relationship is better. Yes, it is. And as a matter of fact, speaking of collaboration, uh, we did just pass a resolution, SCR 145, which I introduced, which is uh, requesting and asking that the state and city collaborate and work together on affordable housing solutions. I'm um, going back to the fact that I'm the housing chair. Uh, uh, the county has its own projects. We have projects. Sometimes we work together, sometimes we don't. But we certainly need to work together yes. because sometimes the county has resources and we might have a project and they can spend it on their own projects or they can um, partner with the state and if we have a project on Oahu, for example, then those county funds could conceivably be used on a state project because at the end of the day, we're still working for Oahu Honolulu residents. And thus, it, it makes sense and we're more efficient if we do work together. We're going to take a break. Very good. And then when we come back, let's talk about the rest of the session. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Hi, we're back. And with today we're talking with my dear friend, Senator Will Espero. And we just came from the wrap-up of the legislature. And there were a lot of bills that I was disappointed. One was the uh, pesticide bill. Yes. And the um, one about the suntan lotion. The oxybenzone. Oxybenzone. Yes. For anybody that doesn't know, that is a chemical that bleaches the coral. So that didn't pass. And so there were a lot of things that didn't pass. Let's talk about the ones that did and their impact in, on, on our environment and on our way of life. Okay. Well, I, as the housing chair, I think that's a good place where I can start. Um, uh, we tried to get more money for uh, housing projects. Um, I had introduced a bill that would have uh, injected $2 billion of funding into projects um, for infrastructure, because you could easily spend hundreds of million dollars on infrastructure when we're talking about drainage, roads, sidewalks. Unfortunately, that didn't pass. What? what it did not pass? It did not pass. Um, uh, because there's still some some issues that need to be resolved in some of the projects, but I felt that uh, 
when you look at the neighbor islands as well, for example, you could easily uh, inject a hundred million dollars into every neighbor island, and that would be you know three hundred million dollars right there. But uh, uh, we did pass some bills um, that will help housing needs for families. So, for example, House Bill 530 uh, is a bill that uh, updates our down payment loan program, uh, especially for young families and new homeowners. So it'll make it easier, provide more information, and provide some assistance on individuals trying to uh, get a down payment. Uh, we also passed Senate Bill 584, which will allow uh, an individual, an applicant, to use an extended or a Hanai family member, usually to help them qualify for a loan. Usually it had to be an immediate family member. So, you know, Hawaii's use of Hanai or extended yeah. um, family members um, should help applicants um, qualify for loans. Uh, HB1 uh, is a measure that will allow tiny homes on ag land. I love tiny and, homes. And these are for ag workers, right. not, not tiny home developments, but um, there's a need for um, uh, workforce housing, and especially in rural areas. And hopefully HB1 um, will be the start of looking at uh, this idea of tiny homes. It's popping up all over, over the world, world yes. and the, this is something I think Hawaii can look at, especially for individuals or couples or even elderly. Um, a, a tiny home, a smaller home, almost like a studio, you know, can be built for. I've seen figures anywhere from, you know, seventy to one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and uh, if a person puts that on their property, for example, uh, the uh, county is promoting ADUs, accessory dwelling units, right. uh, to help uh, the market I just mentioned, and that would certainly go a long way in um, dealing with our lack of affordable rentals, which we mm -hmm. need, and even possibly help some of the homeless, uh, and, and that's a problem. HB 1179 is a project that the unions and developers have been working on uh, that would uh, lower the wages of union workers so that um, it would help lower the cost of housing because many of these union workers who are building these homes, their families and their members can't even afford the home. Right. So this bill would uh, exempt uh, uh, certain homes from uh, the general excise tax and this is, I think, a good measure that's going to be beneficial. And, and finally, we have SB 1244, uh, which would create a housing trust, a nonprofit housing trust. So right now, you have HCDA, the Hawaii Community Development Authority, uh, which is developing the Kakako area. And there are requirements for developers to build affordable units. and uh, hopefully we want these affordable units to be in perpetuity or at least 20 to 30 years. Uh, but if somebody wants to sell one of their affordable units, you know, they have to go to HCDA, which has the right of first refusal. And if HCDA says that we'll buy it and put it back on the market, that's fine and keep it affordable. But HCDA can also say, uh, we don't have the funds or we're not in a position to purchase it and thus the home could be sold now at market rate uh, with this affordable housing not non-profit affordable housing trust uh, the trust can purchase that home in place of the hcda and thus leave that home uh, affordable in perpetuity so so this is a good thing that hopefully will will help and then at the end of the day, the big bill that didn't pass was the rail bill. And rail, as well, you that, know. That was so convoluted. I mean, yes. Everybody has so many different things about it. Yeah. Right. But from my perspective and many others, rail is key to providing and building affordable units. Because 
you know, with 500,000 new people in 50 years, uh, where will they live? Many of them will live in West Oahu and Central Oahu, but easily a couple hundred thousand can live along the rail line if we build high density transit oriented development. And that's what's happening all over the world. And that means building up, up because if we don't build up, then we have to build out. And we have limited land, as you know. We don't have enough land to build out unless we go into our agriculture land and our conservation land, which people want to preserve. Now, but we can't build up or out without the infrastructure you talked about. Right. So, uh, so we didn't get the money for infrastructure? Well, there, there are... Is that, there is that are, what you said? We didn't get the money that I wanted to, to get, but there's still money out there for infrastructure. We have an affordable housing uh, uh, rental fund. Uh, we have uh, DERF, uh, um, uh, an urban revolving fund that developers can tap into. And there are millions of dollars in these funds for developers to, to apply for. However, uh, we need more. But I'm, I'm, talk, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking infrastructure like sewers and water and electricity and cable and all of those things. We need more we money. We need that. Yes. And, we, yes, and so we how do you build those, inf those high rises without putting this in? Well, developers themselves who come in to build, they have access oh. to funds. Oh, the so they, put in, they have to put in the... Well, they can put some in, but government also wants to assist where there's uh, state lands and affordable housing units that are mandated. And money, for example, comes from those two funds I mentioned, um, DERF and ARF, but we also have the conveyance tax that is collected whenever there's a right. real estate sale. Mm -hmm. And that could bring in anywhere from 50 to 100 million dollars a year as well. So there are um, resources and revenues, but we always need more uh, of because course. of this. We have a major shortage of inventory. Right now we have an aging infrastructure. Every day there's yes. a water main break. Every day, you know, we see this aging infrastructure. And so my thought is that I know that some of that is the county, and yes. some of it is the state, and we need to look at those kinds of things today, because that's, that's today. Most of the infrastructure that you're talking about um, is under the jurisdiction of the county, county yeah. and, and they are looking at it, you know, our property taxes go towards that, um, the sewer fees, um, but uh, at the end of the day, government's revenue stream or resources is this much, but the needs and demands of everybody are this much. So that's the dilemma we have in government. I found in my 26 years, Marsha, governing is expensive. It, it is, is not cheap. It is. When you look at everybody's needs and wants and how do we take care of it, and, and that's why we have to prioritize Everything that everyone wants every year at the council or at the legislature does not get funded or passed because we are limited. Well, and we are limited with time. Somehow that always catches up with yes, us. Yes, yes. Thank you so much, and will you come again? I definitely will. Please, I look forward to the invitation. Thank you so much. Aloha.